of the high priest that's taught in Hebrews chapter 9, actually mo through most of the book of Hebrews, and this is just the beginning and the consummation of the work of the high priest in atonement. Uh, another argument is for his coronation, that is Christ being king. That's what Matthew 24, 30 says. It says they would see the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then all the tribes of the land would mourn, and they would see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So it was a sign that the Son of Man was in heaven and on the throne. And uh, just as surely as Jerusalem fell, as foretold by Christ, it is certain that he is at God's right hand today. And thus, when Jerusalem fell, it was a sign that he was in heaven at God's right hand. That's page 50. And uh, now he says that uh, these next three we don't agree with, which demonstrates that Camp's view is not our view, so we are acknowledging that. But he's stating that it was a picture of the defeat of the wicked Daniel and that it was a symbol of the final judgment and a picture of the victory of the faithful. What have you to say about those things? Well, one thing I, I would like to, to point out very quickly is that the final victory of Christ and the final judgment and... Some would deny this, but most would not, is uh, linked to the defeat of Satan and the defeat of the last enemy, as is said in Revelation 20. In fact, when you look at Genesis 3.15, the crushing of the head of Satan is, is directly linked to the defeat of the death that came into the garden, or came into the world the day that Adam and Eve ate that fruit. Now, when you think about the defeat of Satan, and you look through the scriptures at uh, prophecies concerning that, the clearest one and the most emphatic one has to be Romans 16, verse 20, when Paul said, the God of heaven will crush Satan under your feet. Shortly. Shortly. Now, that phrase, shortly, surely he didn't mean that. Surely he didn't mean that the final victory of Christ was at hand. Surely he didn't mean that the defeat of death was at hand. But we have some quotes that we're going to show you in a little bit that talk about the meaning of the phrase at hand and the importance and the weight that that phrase and phrases like it carry. Well, that's going to come up in just a minute, but before we go there, let's talk about maybe one or two other things. All right, one, he said it separated Judaism from the church. Now, that's going to be important when we take a look at some of the things that we found from uh, Brother J.D. Bales, but also he says it settled the question of the sons of God. Now, uh, if the sons of God was a question that was already settled, then what does the destruction of Jerusalem add to that? But you see, in Romans 8, the Bible talked about the sufferings of this present time. That means at that time in the first century, because this is related to the Spirit, because they had the first fruits of the Spirit, right? And Steve Wiggins said, you cannot snatch and slap. <laughs> you can't snatch and slap a... a, uh, a passage out of the New Testament, a Holy Spirit passage, and place a uh, future application on a first century text, right? right? You can't do that. And so he says it has to have a first century application. But even then, the sufferings were first century. The sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that was about to be revealed. And the glory was the glory of the kingdom of God. The glory was the glory of their receiving the inheritance. The glory was the adoption of sons, Romans 9, 4, and Romans 8, 23, which was the redemption, redemption of, the of the body. And as he says in Romans 8, and which is what Brother Kemp is referencing here, the settling the question, the revealing of the true sons Absol of God. Absolutely, the manifesting of them. All right, well, let's, let's go on to this at hand um, uh, statement, and uh, let's see what we have to say on that. Now, we've got a good brother out in Stockton, California. At least the last I heard, that's where he was. I understand he's not doing very well at this time from, from what I've heard. But nevertheless, um, some years ago, we encountered him when we were uh, teaching on uh, eschatology. And uh, he attempted to refute the at-hand statements that related to the coming of the Lord. That's right. And uh, so he came up with what I thought was one of the most novel approaches to the term at hand that I'd ever seen. Um, he calls it the elasticity of time prophecy. Now I want you to listen to this. And uh, I actually renamed it. I called it rubber band exegesis. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, maybe, you know, I could remember that better and it was less syllables to, <laughs> to say, I think, but it certainly sounded better. Well, but at any rate, just wait till you hear what he said. <laughs> but here's what he said about it. A major fallacy of the preterist mentality, and by preterist he refers to those of us who believe that all prophecy was fulfilled in 70 AD. 
A major fallacy of the preterist mentality is a failure to recognize the elasticity. Isn't there some type of character who kind of stretches himself? I don't. Mr. Fantastic. Mr. Fantastic. Okay, so now we got Mr. Fantastic in hermeneutic. This is the Mr. Fantastic hermeneutic. He's, All a, right? co he's a cousin to Humpty Dumpty. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but at any rate, it says that the elasticity of chronological, to, you know, let me read that again because I'm, I'm getting a little bit uh, excited here. A major fallacy of the preterist mentality is a failure to recognize the elasticity of chronological jargon within the context of biblical prophecy. Now, what all that means is at hand doesn't mean that at hand. Shortly to come to pass doesn't mean shortly to come to pass. And soon does not mean soon. Okay. It is a rather common trait in, prophecy, or in prophetic language that an event, while literally in the remote future, now it's literally in the remote future, may be described as near. The purpose in this sort of language is to emphasize the certainty of the prophecy's fulfillment. You know, that sounds very familiar to the comments that Drew Leonard had to make concerning the word mellow. Okay, it certainly does. But continue on. All right. He says there are numerous prophecies of this nature, including passages like James 5, 8, which says, Behold, the judge stands at the door, the coming of the Lord is at hand. That's right. I think Franklin Camp may have had something to say about James 5, 8, does he? He does. Uh, Brother Camp has a timeline in the back of the newer version. You might, if you're an old school preacher, you might have one of the first editions. But uh, the newer edition has this timeline fold out in the back. And he has James 5, 8 right here at the very bottom talking about the destruction of Jerusalem uh, in the end uh, at the fall of Jerusalem of A.D. 70. That's what he says is the end of the miraculous manifestations of the Spirit and the time when all the books of the Bible were written no later than that. He says James 5.8 is talking about that time. So, all right. A very confusing roundabout, William. <laughs> yes, it is. All right, so he goes on and saying, so including passages like James 5.8, the coming of the Lord is at hand. James cannot have been predicting the literally imminent return of the Savior, for such knowledge was not made available to the Lord's penman. Not even Jesus himself knew of the time of his return to the earth. So in other words, is he saying that James 5, 8 is not a reference to the return of Christ? Well, he's saying that it is a reference to the return of Christ, but it can't possibly be Mean at hand. At hand. There you go. And, <laughs> and then he cites Matthew 24, 36 to demonstrate that he's talking about uh, the coming of the Lord. And this is from the menace of radical preterism. Well, let's see uh, about, let's talk about the menace of rubber band exegesis. In a quote from Fort Wallace Jr. in God's prophetic word, Wallace asked the question that we are posing to Wayne Jackson uh, from his comment, has it occurred to you that the fulfillment of a time prophecy cannot be deferred? In other words, the time cannot be changed. You cannot lengthen it longer than it is. And if it says is at hand, that's that rubber band exegesis. If it says it's at hand, it is at hand. And uh, he says the fulfillment of a prophecy cannot be separated from the time and circumstances stated by the prophet. Now, uh, I don't know whether you go in this direction or not. But if you read the first several verses of James chapter 5, you will see the circumstances out of which that prophecy was made. He's talking, he's bringing a judgment or announcing a judgment on people for some wickedness they were doing. And as a result, said the coming of the Lord was at hand. And so it's, it's very, very important. You know, we encourage you to go back and read those verses uh, leading up to James 5, 7, 8, 9. And Brother Wallace said, in which we agree with Wallace, that the fulfillment of a prophecy cannot be separated from the time and circumstances stated by the prophet. That's right. And I was going to say a little bit more about that, the time and the circumstances of James 5, 8, and 9. James says, Behold, the judge stands at the door. He's quoting from the Olivet Discourse, Matthew Absolutely. 24, uh, 29 to 34. That's right. Um, now, the time and circumstance 
of that judgment was within that generation when they would see the signs indicating that the time was near. And so James isn't speaking out of confusion. He's not, uh, he's not just obliterating what Jesus said in Matthew 24, 36, but of that day and hour no man knows. But he is listening to what Jesus said. You, you know what's going to happen in this generation, but you don't know if it's going to happen in the winter. You don't know if it's going to happen on the Sabbath, Matthew 24, verse 20. And so you need to watch for the signs. They didn't know the day or the hour. They didn't even know the season. <laughs> but see, James, towards the end of the first century, sees the signs. He sees the, the marks that Jesus put, the indicators that Jesus put. And he said, the coming of the Lord, the coming of the Lord is at hand. And the judge stands at the door. Is he still standing at the door? Uh, I don't think he's standing at the door. I think he's inside for those who allowed him to come in. <laughs> well, I recall a song that we, uh, that we would often sing that talks about who at the door is standing. Yes. But apparently he's been knocking for 2,000 years and no one's no thought one's to answer. No one's ever opened the door. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, this is a quote from Thomas Warren in the book Premillennialism, True or False from the 1978 Fort Worth College Lectures, uh, pages 15 through 16, on the term at hand. Uh, Brother Warren said, the expression at hand never refers to a time that was past. Neither does the expression refer to a time that is in the far distant future. 600 years before the birth of Christ, Daniel said that God would set up the kingdom, Daniel 2.44. But Daniel did not say that it was at hand at the time he wrote the prophecy. Well, it was a sure event, wasn't it? It was a certain and sure event. So according to Brother Jackson, there would be nothing wrong whatsoever for saying that that was at hand. That's right. And then, uh, but Daniel did not say that it was at hand at the time he wrote the prophecy. At that time, the kingdom was more than 600 years in the future. But when the time was fulfilled and the kingdom was about to appear, it was said to be at hand. In other words, he's saying that they don't announce it as actually being at hand until it is actually what? At hand. The time was not fulfilled at the time when Daniel wrote that it would be set up, for it was more than 600 years in the future at that time. But Jesus did say the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand, Mark 1, 15. The Lord did not say that the time would be fulfilled 2,000 years later. He said <laughs> that the time is fulfilled. Now, when our brethren are talking to premillennialism, kind of like the message we heard today. They pretty much understand at hand, and they don't use rubber band exegesis. That's right. There is no elasticity in their time arguments. Not at all. They won't allow for it. But now think about this, and he ha we have another little word here from, uh, from Brother Warren. But let me say this first. In Revelation 1.1 1, 1, and Revelation 1.3 and Revelation 22.10 and a whole host of other passages from that 22nd chapter, the, uh, the scriptures tell us that the events of Revelation were shortly to come to pass. They were at hand. And it's bookended by phrases exactly like that. Now, the next word in the sentence is premillennialists. But instead, let's, let's insert another name, someone who spoke on this lecture that said the fulfillment of Revelation 20 was in the future. B.J. Clark tells us that the time is not yet come, but the writer of Revelation said that it was at hand. Now, according to Thomas Warren, you can't say that something, and he said 600 years, well, it's been 2,000 years. Absolutely. And yet we have brethren that are saying that the fulfillment of Revelation has not yet occurred when the Bible says it's at hand. What road do we take? Do we take the Mr. Fantastic exegesis of uh, Wayne Jackson, or do we take the very true-to-the-word exegesis of Dr. Thomas Warren? Absolutely. And I, I side with Thomas Warren on this particular text. So you see, we are trying to agree at every point that we can with what we understand the scriptures to say and what the good brethren say when they say the right things. That's right. We're not opposed to agreeing with them. And, um, and that's very, very important to understand uh, along the way as we uh, develop these things. Now, then we have a quote from Drew Leonard which said what? Well, Drew Leonard gets up, he has a chart. And he almost chides the audience, and he tells them, Brethren, you have to stop telling these preterists that at hand doesn't mean at hand. They're laughing at you. And he had the chart that says this, I, that's Drew Leonard, accept the following words in Scripture to mean what they ought to mean. At hand, Matthew 3, 2, Revelation 1, 3, text he cited. Shortly to come to pass, Revelation 1, 1. Approaching, Hebrews 10, 25, 
And that's in the context of the second appearing of Hebrews 9.28, by the way, and the little, little while of Hebrews 10.37, and nigh, or at hand, of James 5, verses 8 and 9. Now, I accept those as well, but it seems like uh, Brother Jackson does not accept those scriptures as what they ought to mean, at least according to Drew Leonard. And at, the, at least at the time he wrote. I'm not sure where he is well, today, but certainly at the time he wrote those, right. and that will create a problem for anyone who uh, seeks to follow them. Now, Jackson also gave us some information on the new heavens and new earth in uh, a book that he's written called God's Prophet, uh, called Isaiah, God's Prophet of Doom and Deliverance. He said, in this final section of chapter 65, the prophet describes the creation of a new heavens and a new earth. This is a symbolic description of the Christian age. Hence, the new heavens and a new earth is merely descriptive of the new realm that will replace the Mosaic period, Isaiah, God's prophet of doom, and deliverance. Now, so Daniel, when does he have this new heaven and new earth coming about? As far as I can tell, uh, he would have it coming about on the day of Pentecost at the latest, maybe at the death of Jesus. Okay, so we have one new heaven and earth coming at the cross. But then he makes another statement. He says, it is clear that the new heavens and earth of Isaiah 65, 17 and forward are not the same as that mentioned in Revelation 21 forward. For in the former, there is sin, death, etc. Whereas in the latter, these things do not exist. Well, I've got a couple questions, William. The church, he says, is a new heavens and new earth, right? Right. Now, what else, what's another name for the church? What is it called in relation to Jesus? It's called the body of Christ. It's called the body of Christ. Is there sin in the body of Christ? Now, think about that. Yeah. Does, does Jesus, the body, him as the head, does that body contain sin? No, no. Of in course, fact, in him is no sin. In fact, doesn't there, isn't there a scripture that said sin is committed where? <laughs> <laughs> We won't get into that right now. That's the discussion we've been having. Uh, but uh, another thing I'd like to say, death. There's no death in Christ. Now you say, hang on now. My great-grandmother, she was a perfectly good Christian lady, and yet she died physically. That's not what Jesus said. John 11, 25 and 26, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Now I believe it. But there's some men on this lectureship that said, including Drew Leonard, if an individual cannot die today spiritually, that is teaching once saved, always saved. That's teaching false teaching. But Jesus said, he that lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? So according to Wayne Jackson's picture and according to Jesus uh, and just simple logic, there wasn't death. And there's not sin in the church. So why can't the church be the new heavens and new earth? Absolutely. And uh, that was a present tense statement when he said, whoever lives and believes in me. And furthermore, uh, we have a couple of passages, uh, for example, in 2 Timothy chapter 2. And this, this becomes a very, rather interesting one. But uh, in 2 Timothy chapter 1, uh, excuse me, uh, the Bible says, in verse 9, beginning, who has saved us and called us with the holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before uh, time began, but has now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. So now we have a new heavens and a new earth and another new heavens and new earth promised according to those on the roundabout. Now we have a text that says death has been abolished, but then they'll go to another text and says death is yet to be abolished, which actually reads that death was being abolished at the time that that was written. And, so, and go back to something we said a while ago, this is all connected to the cross event. What Jesus did at the cross, that's when eschatology that's, that's when the eschaton began. Jesus' coming again was not to reverse what Jesus died to establish. It wasn't to end the very age that Jesus died to establish. It was to consummate it. That's what Hebrews 10 says. Right? That's I come right. to do thy will, O God. I take away the first that I may establish the second. That's correct. Now, uh, go ahead and continue on. All right. William. All right. So now we've got these problems with the new heavens and new earth. So we don't know where to get off the wheel on that one because we got a future one. Uh, that's a future hope. That's right. 
And then we have one that was supposed to already be here. All right, so, so what got, do you got? We've got a coming of the righteousness, righteousness. We already got the righteousness at the cross. We have to have the righteousness, righteousness. We have an end at 8070, but Brother B.J. Clark said we're looking for an end to end. We already have a new heavens and new earth, but Brother Jackson said we're looking for a new, new heavens and a new, new earth. That's <laughs> how so I guess we'll have to say it. And so we also have some who admit that Jesus came in 8070, but now we're also looking for the coming, coming of Jesus to bring I guess in we are. the new, new heavens. All <laughs> so. right, so I guess we're going to look for now the last days, last days, the real last <laughs> days, right? Right. Because um, in uh, a comment from Guy in Woods, from his debate with Ben Franklin, who was a Pentecostal, on the Holy Spirit, he has a chart on page 5 that says, what is the period of the last days? And as we all know, Guy and Woods was a brilliant scholar. Not the Christian dispensation. Wait a minute now. Not the Christian dispensation. Pentecost, first day, not last. 2,000 years since Pentecost, and the end is not yet. Hebrews 1 and 1 places it at the end of the Jewish nation. So, Because he, he would point out in his, uh, in his talk concerning that chart that the last days actually began during the ministry of Jesus when he spoke to the people. And you say, well, he did that through the apostles. If you look at Hebrews 2, uh, 1 and following, you'll see that's not the case in Hebrews 1, 1 and following. It's his personal ministry as distinguished Absolutely. from the apostles' personal yes. ministry. Sorry. And so uh, the last days equals the last days of the Jewish system, and that's Guy and Woods on page five of the Guy and of the Woods uh, Franklin debate. Now, after I left the school, and they changed the books on the Holy Spirit, and this was a debate on the Holy Spirit, right? Right. Um, they changed manuals, and um, we have Curtis Cates in his book on. The AD 70 Theology, page 63, wrote the following. The time of that Pentecost was the last days, the beginning of the last days, the Christian dispensation. Now, wait a minute. Didn't Guy and Woods just say not the Christian dispensation? And Brother Kate said it was the Christian dispensation. To well, whom do we go? Which road which do the we take? I don't know what road I'm taking. Do you know, based on this? <laughs> You know, the people who are listening to this, you know, no wonder we can't defend against, uh, you know, defend against false doctrines. Because everybody's teaching something different all over the place. That's correct. And yet we're the ones that are being, uh, that are being this fellowship because, as we'll see in a little bit, we're taking what is called the logically uh, sound position. But let's talk about the passing away of the law. In the churches of Christ, it is undoubtable that the number one teaching concerning the law is the law was nailed to the cross. No law passed the cross. No old covenant is left to the cross. It was gone at the cross. Now there's exceptions to that and very notable exceptions. And here's one that you can see on the screen now. Now you may recall uh, in the debate with Dr. David Hester, which was uh, um, published on the GBN broadcast, right? Yeah, yes. Okay. Uh, and Don Preston, that one of the arguments that Don made was on Acts chapter 21. I believe that Holger Neubauer made the same argument with um, Howard Denham. Right. And both men denied that the law was enforced, that Paul kept the law, and that he followed those prescriptions according to the law, and that there were myriads of Jews who believed who believe? that kept the law. Right. It was Jews who believed. Right. Yeah, yeah. Oh, <laughs> that was so interesting to watch. When he quoted that passage, you heard everything very audibly, but when he got to the word believed, it was like under his breath. And, uh, and I called attention to Don and said, did you hear that? Uh, we could barely hear. What, didn't even want to quote the text. Many myriads of Jews who believed the Bible said. That's and right. they were all zealous for the law. And we're about to find out why. Exactly. All right. Now, um, I think he told the story uh, about Lewis Carroll's um, Humpty Dumpty, right? That, that's correct. He did. Well, Lewis Carroll wrote another story, didn't he? He did. And that story was about Alice in Wonderland. 
And Alice came to a road, and there was a Cheshire cat in the top of the tree, right? That's right. And she asked, you know, which road do I take? It was a fork in the road. And so he said, well, where are you going? And she said, I don't know. Well, he said, well, then it doesn't matter which road you take. Well, it does matter to us which road that is taken. But you see, if we look at all of these different concepts and positions that people have, uh, they all seem to be leading in different directions. So it doesn't matter which road they take, they stay in fellowship, right? That's right. <laughs> but uh, if we take a certain road, it's, you know, an anathema. If we actually follow, if we get a map from each individual and we, we put together the directions and follow that map, we get withdrawn from. Yeah, absolutely. That's how it happens. And this is one of the main ones right here. All right. Now, let's notice. This is from J.D. Bales in his instrumental uh, music in the New Testament worship. Uh, the question was asked about instrumental music. And uh, he said Paul participated. The argument was Paul participated in the temple service where instruments were used. This justifies their use in the church. The answer was the following. First, this binds the entire law. Acts 21, 24. Notice what text he cites. This binds zeal for keeping the law and requiring others to keep it. Acts 21, 20, 21, and 24. Purification in the temple. Acts 21, 26. 24 and verse 18. Paying for the service. Acts 21, 23 and verse 24. Offering, Acts 21, 26, and 27. Circumcising children according to the law, Acts 21, 21. And vows and shaven heads, Acts 21, 23, and 24. There is no express reference to instrumental music, although it was part of a certain aspect of the temple worship. The argument cannot justify one part of the law to the exclusion of another part. That's right. All right. Now, let's go on. He further writes... Second, the argument cannot apply to anyone today. It cannot be used to bind the law on Gentiles, Acts 21, 25, 15, 1 through 5, and verse 24. It was a temple service, Acts 21, 25, 15, 1 through 5, and 24, excuse me, Acts 21, 20 through 26, and no one has the right to move the temple into the church. That's right. Number two, it applied to Jews at that time. Acts 21, 20, 21, and 24. It is irrelevant for Jews today, for no one can keep Moses' law and the temple worship. To make it relevant, one would have to restore the entire temple system and then prove that Jewish Christians should keep it. Acts 21, 20 through 27. I just got in there, Dick. Okay, go right ahead. Daniel 12, verse 2 predicts the resurrection of the just and the unjust. David has to agree to this. He said that's the same as John 5, 28, 29, and Acts 24, 14, 15. Now, he changed his mind a couple times, but he did agree with it at least one point, and many other brethren do, believe me. Um, however, Daniel 12 indicates that there would be an abomination of desolation. You can't have that without the temple. And so in order, not all, in order to have instrumental music, according to this argument, you have to reestablish the temple but also to have a futurist eschatology anticipating the resurrection of the just and the unjust of Daniel 2, you got to restore the temple. Absolutely. And as we noticed, many of the speeches, and especially the one by B.J. Clark, you know, there was a total, uh, and I think Drew Leonard as well, uh, ignoring of this point of the relevance of the temple to the coming of the Lord, because they both cited 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Right. All right. And uh, point number four, uh, he says, substance instead of shadow exists now, uh, Hebrews 8, 5, Hebrews 9, 23 through 28, and also 10 and verse 1. We are not to be judged by the law, and he cites Colossians 2, 17. Did you have anything you wanted to say at that point? <laughs> Do I have anything I wanted to say? <laughs> I knew you did. <laughs> he says we have the substance now. Now, what he means by that is the law was types and shadows of good and things to come. Included in that was the high priest. And the high priest was a shadow of the redemptive work of Jesus Christ, by the way, which Flavel Nichols said is limited to the 70 weeks. That's right. That includes the uh, offering. That includes appearing in the most holy place for our sins at, at what Hebrews writer said was at, at that present time. And that includes a second appearing apart from sin but for salvation, Hebrews 9.28. In chapter 10 and verse 1, a passage that Brother Bell Bells also wanted to bring into the discussion, he says, for... He's going to appear a second time. For 
the law having a shadow of good things to come. Now, if we have the substance, that means that these good things to come, well, they've come, right? That's right. And so that means the second appearing of Christ, if we have the substance, has to have already taken place. That's right. It had to be a part of the types and shadows. And, and... Going back to Drew Leonard's speech, he said the Hebrews 9:28 salvation is equivalent to the redemption of the body of Romans 8, if I if I remember correctly, and he said that is a physical resurrection. Wow! So <laughs> wrestle with that one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and then now the question of expediency, because some argue that Acts 21 was a matter of expediency in their attempt to get around the fact that Paul actually kept the law and that there were myriads of Jews who believed who kept the law, according to Acts 21. Now notice, he says, fourth, this is again, uh, continuing quotes from J.D. Bales. This is on page 92. Fourth, did Paul do what he did in Acts 21 as a matter of expediency? 1 Corinthians 9.20. One, he did not do anything similar with reference to pagan worship. Number two, if it had not been lawful for Paul to do it at that time, it could not have been expedient and it would have frustrated the gospel. So if you try to do something as a matter of expediency, which is not lawful, J.D. Bell says it frustrates the gospel. Now I know some of these... Uh, Brethren will have a problem with accepting uh, maybe comments from J.D. Bells because of his position on marriage, remarriage, and divorce. However, he wrote a lot of things that were very, very good and um, that they do accept. Like prophecy and premillennial. Absolutely, absolutely, and, and several other works. And so um, the point being is this is not a novel idea with us. We've got other brothers who taught the same thing on Acts 21, and regardless of what his view is on another position, we have to evaluate what he's saying here to determine whether or not it is true. And certainly, uh, it does. But now, we've got some... Can I read this one, brother? Go ahead, go ahead. I'm, I'm so excited. <laughs> go ahead. All right, here's another comment by Brother Bells. Um, by the way, he has an excellent debate on the existence of God. I read that a couple years ago, and I really enjoyed the read. Uh, but listen to this. Fifth, how can we harmonize the fact that Paul kept the law and sanctioned Jewish Christians doing it, as James explained? That's why James had him offer up this purification offering, yes. to prove that he was not teaching Jews to forsake the law of Moses. That's what the scripture says. Now, by the way, the position of an elder was a, a position that came with miraculous gifts to assist in that work. Ephesians 4, 8, uh, through 16 show us that. So that was a sanctioned theme by the Holy Spirit, in my opinion. Now, well, here's what he says. Here's his answer to this problem. He says, I believe, listen to these words, <laughs> that this was a transitional period during which God permitted Jewish Christians to continue in the law, but later prohibited it, prohibited it through the old, through the old system vanishing. And he cites Hebrews uh, 8 and verse 13 in his footnote, and through the express statement that one cannot serve the tabernacle, Hebrews 13 and verse 10. Absolutely. Now, transition period. I've heard that phrase before, William. Absolutely. Can you enlighten me on that? Well, we've been talking about a transition period from 30 to 70 A.D., basically, that that was the time in which all things were being fulfilled. That was the time in which things were being progressively revealed. Uh, Franklin Kemp admits the same thing, and that we didn't have full revelation, so they weren't expected to, you know, follow everything immediately that took place over a period of time. To, so, cl to clarify, I don't... Uh, I don't know if Franklin Kemp said that they could keep the law. I think No, that... he didn't say that they could okay, keep the okay, law, okay, but he was talking right. about the work of the Holy Spirit being gotcha. revealed and, and uh, revelation being revealed uh, uh, progressively over that time. But that's just another one of those roundabouts. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> and so um, that God permitted these Jewish Christians to continue in the law, but later, and at the same time he allowed the Jewish Christians to do so, he would not allow the Gentiles to do so. And that was a very perfect reason for that. He, this, this article, or this, not article, but this chapter in his book is excellent. 
Yes. You, you need to get a copy. You need to get a copy of this book. That's as, right. As Don would say. <laughs> and, uh, and take a look at that chapter, Paul and the Law, Acts 21, 18 to 27. Does so, an excellent job. Yeah, so here's what he says on page 93. The law had been a divine institution for centuries. And until God made the full revelation about its nature and duration, he tolerated Jewish Christians continuing in the law. Now, hang on a second, William. When was the full revelation completed according to these men that we've read after? It was completed in 70 A.D. That's or right. Or at least just prior to. And so, um, he tolerated Jewish Christians continuing in the law. Christ did not reveal the full truth during his personal ministry. Although he said things which indicated the abolition of the law. Listen. Matthew 5, 17 and 18. John 20, oh, John 4, 20 through 24, and 16, 12 through 14. The total truth was not revealed all at once, and Franklin Camp agrees with that point. That's what I was referring to a moment ago. Gotcha. But only gradually. For example, the relationship of the Gentiles to the law, Acts 10, although some things were revealed in principle, they were not understood until they were later revealed in their fullness. And so that is what J.D. Bales said about it. Now, I know there's a lot of questions on the subject, William, but allow me to just think out loud for a moment. The scriptures say in 1 Corinthians 11, you just showed forth the Lord's death till he come. As often as you, you know, take of this, you just show forth the Lord's death till he come. Well, does that mean that the Lord's Supper would not be understood in its fullness until all of it was revealed well, by the fall of Jerusalem. In absolutely, and that's exactly what Jesus told them in right. Luke chapter 22. I'll eat it new with you in my Father's kingdom. That's right. Now how can he eat if he's not here? That's right. <laughs> all right, and um, 6, uh, J.D. Bell says on page 94, the book of Hebrews and Judaism, although these truths are found elsewhere, the full revelation is found in Hebrews concerning the nature, duration, and cessation of the law. Number one, Acts 21, 20 through 26, bound the law at that time. But we are bound by Christ's full revelation, Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. That which was nigh unto vanishing, as Daniel cited before, and he cites Hebrews 8 and verse 13, he says, now has vanished. And so, as we have shown, the situation was different from what it was after the truths were fully revealed. This is still J.D. Bell. That's by the right. Way. No one today was brought up as was the generation of Acts 21. See, we don't have that situation anymore. Under the law, while it was still a divine institution and binding on man. Now, this is why Paul in Romans 7. He describes his life under the law. Then he says, but now, and he continues to describe a similar, similar life. And so he proclaims. Who will deliver me from the body of this death? And he said it would be Jesus Christ as Lord. And he said that that redemption of that body would take place at the end of the miraculous age, at the end of those sufferings, and in about to, about to uh, come time frame. And through the first fruits of the Spirit. Right. And you can't snatch and slap them out of the first century. <laughs> That's right. All right. And slap a 21st century interpretation on them. All right, you can't snatch them out of the 1st century and then slap a 21st century interpretation on them. That does vile injustice to the text. Stephen Wiggins. No one lives in the period of the incomplete revelation. So we can't live in that same way, but that's the way brethren want us to live. They want us to live that way eschatologically. We can't go back. We can't go back into that period. It's gone in terms of that uh, pre-70 A.D. period of time, as these brethren have been showing. So our situation differs from that of Acts 21, according to J.D. Bales. Now, after all of this, Daniel, what are we to conclude? We've been on the roundabout circling, trying to figure out where do we get off. Whether we get off with Flavel Nichols, whether we get off with Guy and Woods, Curtis Cates, Foy Wallace Jr., Keith Mosier, uh, Keith Mosier Drew Leonard, and uh, just about a host of speakers that spoke on the South Haven lectures, where do we get off? Now, they're in all different directions. They're on almost every street on the roundabout saying, come with me. Another one saying, come with me. Come with here. Come with me here. Drew Leonard saying, no, don't go there. Come <laughs> with me. That's right. So where are we going? Here's what Gary Workman said. He gave us the solution. See, we even listen when you give us the solution. Gary Workman gave us the solution on page 423 of the Fried Hardeman Lectures, or rather on page 305 of the Fried Hardeman Lectures, and I think that was 1991. One. Okay. 
He said, the king view of eschatology has taken Wallace's primary view and driven it to its logical conclusion. Wait a minute. Are we supposed to be logical or illogical? Logical. So if you don't take Wallace's primary view and drive it to its logical conclusion, that means you are being what? Illogical. Illogical. That means all of these brethren who are not taking their view to their logical conclusion, well, they have to be being illogical. That's correct. And so uh, we hope that you've seen enough of the uh, disagreements, the contradictions, the varied opinions of brethren, and you've seen enough of the truth in what they're writing to understand how we are piecing these things together and arriving at a logical conclusion to say all Bible prophecy has been fulfilled. And as a result of that, some exciting things are happening around the world, not just in a local place, but around the world. That's right. Uh, as a matter of fact, you know, uh, I know that Don and and uh, Stephen Wiggins, uh, <laughs> excuse me, Steve Basden, <laughs> but I know that Don Preston and Steve Basden have been uh, invited to the Philippines. At least there's been talk of that. Well, I just got an email from, or, or at least a Facebook message the other night from the Philippines that says, hey, how about you and Holger making plans to come as well? Now look, Holger, if you're watching and you and I go to the Philippines, please do something about that. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Look, I love that brother. Uh, he's a great man, and I appreciate him so much. And Gloria, please forgive me. I'm just kidding with Holger. We just had a little fun. She, she would agree with you, from what I understand. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, uh, and we just got back from Nicaragua, where we were invited to come to teach eschatology for almost over two, two weeks, a little bit over two weeks that we were there. And we stayed there, and we taught, and uh, actually sat on the front porch and built a website for the gentleman who was there, the preacher who was there, and, um, and he started teaching eschatology uh, right away. And he's, he's originally from Canada, and, uh, but he's living in Nicaragua. He has a congregation there. And he said that he's going to even take the word back to Canada. So he said, look, I'm not worried about what people are going to say. He says, this is the truth, and I'm going to teach them. And, of course, I taught Amen. there uh, in the congregation. So there's some exciting things. I mean, you know, we've had... Uh, missions in Paris and uh, uh, Don Australia. has in Australia. Don and I have gone to Australia and um, uh, all around the world. We, we hear from people all around the world. Singapore, you name it. People are learning this. Um, we've even had opportunities where Pentecostal churches have called us to come in. You know, you know, form, we could say form in terms of their, their Holy Spirit views and ask us to teach them about the very principles that we find in Franklin Camp's book. Uh, but do it consistently, you know, be logical in everything that we do. And, uh, and I went there last year and taught. Of course, um, they stopped believing in uh, working miracles, speaking in tongues and all of that a while back since they discovered our writings and have invited me to come and I've spoken and they took me to another church and had me speak and they're trying to get this message out as far and wide as they possibly can. We're having experiences with people from just about every kind of faith you can name who are discovering these truths and saying please teach us help us uh, and, and they're uh, just absolutely doing just amazing things yeah it's it's fantastic and you know I guess let's talk a few moments about the point of the video sure you know, the point of this video is not to simply you know point out the contradictions but there's a reason why we're doing that what we're trying to do is uh, encourage our brethren in the churches of Christ the the groups, the group that we grew up in, practically. William ha came. He has a neat story about his about his faith. You should ask him about it in, in private. But uh, um, we're trying to encourage you to recognize these very bad problems, these contradictions. Recognize these disagreements and these inconsistencies, and sit down and hash these things out. We want to do that with you. We're not trying to overthrow your churches or, you know, take your members or whatever. We're trying to get to the truth of God's word. And we want you to sit down with us reasonably and openly. Forget all the straw men and the lies that have filled books and lectureships and, and broadcasts intentionally or unintentionally, regardless of the intent. You know, it's still false misrepresentation. And let's sit down and study these issues together. There is truth in God's word.
It can be found, but it's up to us to sit down, to diligently study these things, and to try our best to fulfill uh, the restoration plea that we've heard preached from the pulpits our entire lives, practically. Absolutely. And uh, this is just, you know, one of the things that, as Daniel says, that, you know, that we want to do and, uh, and to sit down. And, you know, occasionally we have those who are willing to do so. And uh, they will call us and we'll sit down and we'll talk with them or we'll talk with them over the phone. Some of them are struggling right now in their understanding of these things and they're trying to find the answers. Um, you know, even when I talk about how, how Don and I met, uh, we had a, a common friend who actually found a paper that uh, I had written and uh, it had caused a lot of controversy in the city of Memphis, but he passed that paper on to Dunn, and Dunn was uh, looking at certain things in the scriptures that I had kind of worked out a little bit uh, before he did, and uh, once he read that paper, he called me up on the phone, and of course, we've been working together, together ever since. So this is what's going on. People are asking these questions. They're struggling with these things. They want answers, and um, we're trying to provide those answers, but to do it in a very, uh, very consistent way. That's right. And so we hope that those of you who watch this video will stop just discounting these things by saying, oh, well, it's not a matter of fellowship, or oh, it's not a salvation issue. We agree, but we want you, uh, we want to try to be consistent with the scriptures. You know, should we try, should we give up having a proper understanding and a consistent understanding of the scriptures just for saying, oh, it's not a fellowship issue? That, that excuse and that, uh, what would you call it, a cop-out is, shouldn't be used anymore. Let's just try to find out what the Bible says so we can have a more perfect understanding of the scriptures as Ananias or as uh, Aquila and Priscilla would like for Apollos to have in uh, the book of Acts. We want to have a more perfect understanding and we want you to have a more perfect understanding and we believe that we can reach that not in opposition, not as enemies, but coming together to study the Word of God uh, more perfectly. All right. Well, Daniel, I think that that uh, pretty much wraps up everything, unless you can think of something that I have overlooked that I have forgotten. The only thing uh, I can think of is that William owes me apology for keeping me up until the crack of dawn last night testing microphones. <laughs> I realize. <laughs> he, he, called, he called me. Uh, I, I got a phone call at 7 o'clock and I woke up. Well, then I must have cut off my alarm and fell back to sleep because I heard this morning at about 8 o'clock or 8.24, we had to leave at 8.30, Daniel, 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 are you up? <laughs> and I jumped up and said, what time is it? So, <laughs> No, but brother, besides that, I've enjoyed the week with you. And I look forward to producing more material with you. And to actually go to the lecture ships to hear another, hopefully, good lesson. We've heard good lessons. Yeah. Great lessons, in fact. And we hope to hear another good one tonight. So. Right. All right. Well, thank you very much. I'm William Bell with All Things Fulfilled. This is Daniel Rogers with um, Labor Not in Vain. That's it. And uh, we've had a great time. So it's been good working with you. I tell you, this young man is absolutely uh, incredible. Uh, he has a brilliant mind, uh, excellent recall, a uh, very good student, and uh, Loves the Word of God. I appreciate it, brother, and this old man's not too bad himself. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, thanks a lot.